My name is Paul Matthews. I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Worcester Regional Research Bureau. And it's my, uh, one of the nicest events and initiatives the Bureau does on a yearly basis are these awards. So I want to thank all of you for being here today as part of our celebration. And my first task is to introduce Kathy Gagne, committee member for the Thomas Green Awards, incidentally. And our host today, uh, Mechanics Hall, has been tremendously generous to open itself up and uh, provide such a wonderful surroundings for us for this celebration. So, Kathy, thank you. Good evening and welcome, all of you. Um, thank you so much, Paul and Eric and Alan Ganley for making this event as special as it is every year. It's my great privilege to serve on the committee um, to select the awardees and um, it's been a, a wonderful experience over the last three years. So um, congratulations to all of you. Um, I have to tell you that the spring at Mechanics Hall is a joyous season. Um, we do a lot of award events like tonight's. Um, we have uh, students uh, honors awards. We've got, um, we had correctional officers in here the other day statewide with their awards. So people are always happy this time of year and even happier this year for being in person and together. So um, I'm just thrilled to have you here and um, celebrating uh, the awardees skills and achievements <clears throat> uh, as an example of the excellence the diligence the creativity and the innovation that our organization the worcester county mechanics association has heralded since 1842 and so you inspire us all um, and your work <clears throat> excuse me and your work enriches the communities that you live in and work in. So thanks so much for all of you being here and congratulations to all the award winners. So I have to introduce Ellen Ganley, who is chair of the Thomas Green Awards Committee. Uh, thank you, Kathy, and I just need to say thank you to a few people before I say thank you to Ellen and turn it over to her. But as I mentioned, I'm the executive director and CEO of the Bureau. We're, as many of you I think are aware, we're nearing middle age. We're a 37-year-old nonprofit that serves the public interest of Greater Worcester by conducting independent, nonpartisan research and analysis of public policy issues. Now, that all sounds very somber, somber very reasoned, and very objective. Today, however, is a celebration, and we really want to commemorate and recognize that we do this on a yearly basis because there are so many public servants that don't get the attention they deserve. So I want to thank all of you, not only the award winners, but those who nominated you, your family members, and others who make your work possible. I also not only need to thank Kathy, but need to thank all of our event sponsors, which are recognized here, Country Bank, Lamoureux Pagano Associates, Architects, Beals and Thomas, St. Cobain, UMass Chan Medical School, VHB, Wind Companies, National Grid, Rick and Joanne Powell, and our media sponsor, the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, and our in-kind sponsors, who should be added, um, provide gifts to each of the award winners and honorees. Uh, the Beachwood Hotel, the DCU Center, the Ecotarium, the Hanover Theater, Mechanics Hall, Sharfman's Jewelers, the Worcester Art Museum, Worcester Bravehearts, Worcester Historical Museum, Worcester Railers, and Worcester Wares. Um, I also want to take a moment and just stress that these awards are also possible due to the support of the city of Worcester, surrounding municipal and regional governments, and school systems, particularly the Worcester Public Schools. Long-standing supporters and firm believers in this program have included City Manager Augustus, Superintendent Benenda, who's with us tonight, and uh, Mayor Petty. Now, due to the transitions involved with everything right now, uh, we're keeping the program kind of simple tonight. Um, however, all of them have been tremendous champions of this, and many of the nominations couldn't have happened without all of them making sure that public servants were adequately recognized. 
So uh, the last people I need to thank are my colleagues at the Bureau, um, all of whom are here. Uh, Josh, David, and Eric, and Eric Neeland in particular puts together this program every year and does a wonderful job. And Ellen and her colleagues on the committee, many of whom are here tonight, are critical. We have a committee of really committed and invested community leaders who help us select the nominees. So one reminder is, those of you who did nominations, the award winners, please consider nominating someone next year. Uh, we, we like to view it as paying it forward, and we'd love to have your help and support ensuring that we continue to recognize exemplary public servants in municipal and regional government. So on that note, it's my proud task to turn this back over to Ellen, who does a wonderful job chairing the committee, such a wonderful job. She's continued to do it, so thank you. Ellen's with the Community Action Council and is a former employee not only of the city of Worcester, but of the Massachusetts legislature, which is where we first met. Good evening, everyone. As Paul said, my name is Ellen Ganley, proud chair of the Thomas Green Committee, Award Committee. I just want to welcome you all this evening, and what an honor it is to be here tonight. Beautiful room. Thank you so much, Kathy. I have the pleasure of representing the committee as the chair. Um, as a recovering municipal employee myself, um, I believe wholeheartedly in the importance of recognizing these recipients who, during these truly unprecedented times, went above and beyond uh, the call of duty to support all of us in Central Mass. Throughout its history, the Thomas Green Award has celebrated hundreds of unsung heroes in public service. This year's recipients are no exception. The Green Awards are made to publicly recognize the efforts of individuals exhibiting the following characteristics. Exceptional competence and efficient handling of all assigned responsibilities. Enthusiastic performance of tasks above and beyond the call of duty. Cooperative, helpful, friendly attitude towards the public and fellow employees. And community involvement outside the scope of job-related responsibilities. Thank you to our honorees for your time, your hard work, your expertise, and your selflessness. We all owe a debt of gratitude to these recipients and truthfully to the many other frontline workers throughout our region. At this time, I'd like to recognize any past Thomas S. Green Award recipients who are here this evening and just ask you to stand for a quick round of applause. And um, we would be here all night if we did this individually, so I'm just also additionally going to ask if, there, if you're in the room and you also happen to work for a municipality, public school, regional agency, or other public service entity, please stand so we can thank you for your time as well. Don't be shy. <laughs> well, each of... Um, each of this evening's honorees bring their own skills and expertise to the roles they hold. There are distinct similarities among them. Altogether, tonight's recipients represent a combination of nearly 75 years of public service. 75, that's amazing. Browsing through the nominations with the committee members, words such as team player, enthusiastic, dedicated, go-to person, adaptable were offered time and time again. Having had the pleasure of meeting our honorees personally, I would also add humble and modest. Joe, Matt, Zach, Connor, and Kara, tonight you join a distinguished class of remarkable public servants. Be proud of this honor and know that all of us gathered here this evening are indeed very proud and very appreciative of your hard work in public service. Before we get into the formal ceremony and properly honor these remarkable individuals, I want to take a moment to thank all of the, my fellow committee members for their diligence in selecting this year's incredible recipients. You all that are winning this evening rose to the top of a very competitive field of uh, nominations that we received. I'd like to thank my fellow committee members, Che Anderson from UMass Chan Medical School, Joyce Augustus, Dan DeTulio from Assumption University, our host, Kathleen Gagney from Mechanics Hall, Alex Guardiola from Worcester Regional Chamber of Commerce, Karen Luddington from Worcester Area Mission Society, Paul, Kate McAvoy from UMass Memorial Healthcare, Dave Nordman, Todd Rodman of Cedar and Chandler, 
Hank Stoltz from Talk of the Commonwealth, and Ron Waddell from Legendary Legacies. Great group to work with. Um, the reviewing of applications is uh, fun, let's put it that way. I'd also like to thank this year's sponsors for their generous support. We're very appreciative of your support and of the, of the recipients as well as the ceremony. I encourage you to read through the sponsor page in the program, check out the screen. Um, in particular, we want to thank Country Bank as our county level sponsor. Additionally, we certainly couldn't host the event without this beautiful room, so thank you, Kathy. It's a beautiful room, beautiful evening, and we're happy to be here. I'd also like to thank Senate President Emerata Harriet Chandler, <coughs> excuse me, Senator Michael Moore, as well as Representative John Mahoney, who've all provided citations from the State House for our honorees that they'll receive in their gift bags. Without further ado, let's start the ceremony. Our first honoree this evening is Joseph Carpenter, head customer service representative from the treasurer and collector's office at the city of Worcester. Unfortunately, Joe's not able to be here this evening, but many of his family are gathered and we're happy to honor him. After 30 years on the job, Joe was noted in his nomination as a critical team player and an agent of change as the department moves to a brand new financial system. Remarkably, he was also credited with saving at least one marriage. <laughs> it's my pleasure to invite committee member, Assistant Vice Chancellor for, the, uh, for City and Community Relations at UMass Chan Medical School, Che Anderson, to the podium to introduce Joe's brother, Dan, to accept the award. Okay, we're just gonna do this, this is fun. It's all right, it's okay. It, no, no, it's fine. I blame you and Paul, but it's fine. <laughs> How's it going, folks? Um, it's, it's okay, you know, I've been doing yoga. Um, so, so um, first things first, I happen to, to know Joseph Carpenter, um, and, and I'll get into that in a second, but as I sat and, and tried to figure out what the best things were to tell you um, and why he represents uh, the best in the municipality, or, or I'd say even beyond that, um, I thought back to the nominations, and there were two things that were brought up that I think were imperative. One was that um, after so long at City Hall, when it came time for the municipality to have a brand new system, Joe was one of the first people to step up and say, let's do it, let's learn, let's onboard people. And I don't know how many of you uh, know municipal employees, but that, that normally isn't the reception you get from folks who've been around for 20 plus years. Um, but I think that openness um, is indicative of the kind of person that he is, right? Always looking to onboard new people, looking to bring them along, looking to try new things if they're gonna be the best or most effective for others. Um, also, uh, you know, as the head customer service rep, uh, in treasury and collection specifically, he's constantly dealing with people who are paying their bills or taxes, which is not the best of time to be dealing with people at City Hall. Um, and so to have made it, you know, about 30 years in that sort of position in that role, um, and to keep finding himself, you know, getting new opportunities to also bring others along, again, it speaks to the kind of person he is, right? Someone who has a cool hand, someone who's calm, someone who's welcoming and able to sort of speak to people when they're at their wit's end because that line is super long and your lunch is only one hour and you've been standing in front of the clerk's office and there are 30 people in front of you and it's hot on a summer day and Joe still, in a very cool and calm and collected manner, is able to get you in and out without too many issues, right? Um, but the other part, part of being a Thomas Green Award uh, winner is what you do outside of the job. And uh, there are two things, one of which Joe isn't even aware of, I believe. Um, and I wish he was here to tell him that this something came, came about a few years ago. Um, but for those who don't know, I used to work for the city of Worcester. And um, I used to help oversee the oval, the ice rink that comes in every year. And Joe was the first city employee during my time there to ask um, if he could bring his own skates and just get out there during lunch. Um, and, and oddly enough, it was something we hadn't even considered, like, like that city employees would want to go out there and skate during their lunchtime. But because of it, um, we implemented a new rule where if you were an employee of City Hall, you got to go out there and skate for free during your lunch period and after work hours. Um, and so that entire idea came because Joe asked about it and wanted to find an opportunity. So again, even without him knowing, he found ways to provide access for other employees um, when it came to social settings. But the last thing I wanted to mention uh, before I get off the stage and uh, break my back uh, <laughs> um, 
is that every week, uh, particularly around the pandemic, um, during the school year, Joe organized a group of city employees to get together and go play some basketball. Um, and I transitioned to UMass Chan during that time, but still, Joe would invite me to come with the guys, um, and every once in a while, a lady, which was great, um, because she ended up being so much better than most of the guys who were there playing. Um, and it was, it was on Wednesday night, and for a couple of hours every week, it was an opportunity to decompress and to build new community. You had folks from, from water and sewer and, and other parts of DPW. You had folks from inspectional services. You had folks from the city manager's office. You had folks from treasury. And so there were people who traditionally may not mingle or have an opportunity to connect, and it provided new friendships and new bonds. Um, and one of the nominees, who's maybe one of the funniest, or nominees, one of the people who nominated Joe, who's hilarious, spoke to saving a marriage. Um, and, it, and it seemed like it was played for a joke, but he mentioned it uh, when we were all playing. And he said his rationale was that during the pandemic, he had just been home with his wife and kids and it was the first time in a long time that they saw each other all the time, every day. And he said, you know, you know I was able to like trick my wife into marrying me and that came with her not being around me all the time. And during the pandemic, she started realizing she might have made a mistake. And so if it wasn't for this basketball thing every Wednesday, we would have definitely gotten divorced. And so um, he credited Joe to finding opportunities and time for other people to get together, again, to decompress, to build camaraderie, and to do something bigger than themselves. And so with that, um, I'd love to call up Dan Carpenter, Joe's brother, because Dan, your brother is an amazing and exceptional human being and an even better city employee. And so this first Thomas Green Public Service Award is presented to you on behalf of us for Joseph Carpenter. Well, thank you. It's nice to see everybody. And Joe is very upset that he couldn't come today, but he did want to say thank you to everyone who he works with, the treasure collectors. It's a team effort, and he, he knows that, and you're only as good as the team that you have working with you and beside you. So he wants to share this award with them. And uh, Joe's wife is here, and my brother and sister came from out of state to uh, share in this award. So. It's very important and it's very nice, as uh, the executive director said, that we actually get to hear something nice about government in an environment that we don't often hear people praised for the dedication that they do. So on behalf of my brother, thank you and good luck to all the other recipients. Our next honoree this evening has served the city for more than a quarter of a century. Dedicated to opening the game of golf to all, he is credited with launching junior golf camps, youth caddy and mentor programs, as well as special events for veteran golfers. It's my pleasure to welcome Bill Doyle of the Telegram and Gazette on behalf of Thomas Green Committee member Dave Nordman to introduce Matt Moisen, Director of Golf at Green Hill Municipal Golf Course. So I'm more of a writer than a speaker, so I'm going to have to read this. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Doyle, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about Matt Moisen, one of tonight's honorees. As the golf columnist for the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, I've interviewed Matt many times during his 26 years as director of golf at Green Hill Municipal Golf Course, and he's always been accommodating and interesting. I've gotten to know him even better the last seven years while I've been a member at Green Hill. As I wrote in my golf column last Sunday, Matt said he wasn't quite sure how to feel, how to feel about receiving the Thomas Green Public Service Award. While he was honored, he wondered if he deserved to be rewarded for just doing his job. Of course, such a selfless attitude is one of the reasons why he's such an effective public servant. He told me, I always view what I do here at the golf course as just customer service. That's essentially what my job is. It has much less to do with golf 
than interaction with people. So when you ask me about the Thomas Green Service Award, it's nice that somebody recognizes that the go golf world is not just golf. It's first and foremost customer service. It's also what I do every single day. I guess I have a hard time swallowing people saying, what a great public servant you are, because that's what they hired me to do. And that's what he said. Matt always tells his staff when he hires them that they're in the people business first. They just happen to do it at a golf course. Matt graduated from St. Bernard's High School in Fitchburg and from Fitchburg State College, but he did not play golf for either of them. He planned to become a history teacher, but he got hooked on golf while he was cutting the grass at Maplewood Golf Course, now called Settlers Crossing, in Lunenburg during the summers while he was in college. He enjoyed golf so much he registered for the PGA Apprentice Program. Matt served as an assistant pro for two years at Marlboro Country Club and for three years as an assistant at Gardner Golf Course before becoming only the third head pro at Green Hill which opened way back in 1929. Three pros since 1929. Walter Cosgrove and Bruce Doby were the first two. At the suggestion of former TNG executive editor Dave Nordman, I nominated Matt for this award. Green Hill is one of the busiest golf courses in the area, hosting 34,000 rounds a year and Matt has impacted countless lives for the better. Winner of the New England PGA Junior Golf Leader Award in 2001, he has gone above and beyond the call of duty with skill and enthusiasm. During his first year at Green Hill, he began a free junior golf camp that has introduced the game to up to 150 youngsters a year, every year, with the exception of 2020, when the pandemic hit hard and the program had to be canceled, but it came back last year. In 2009, he named the camp after Danny Rossetti, who died in a car accident at age 26 the previous fall. Danny had been a camper for the first few years and later worked in the club's pro shop and volunteered at the camp. Danny's parents and brothers volunteer at the camp and credit Matt with helping them cope with their grief. Many years ago, Matt partnered with the Mass Golf Association to conduct a separate camp for more than 300 inner city children. In 2007, Matt began the only caddy program at a public golf course in the state at the time. The program was formed to provide youths with in need with a way to earn money and to learn the game. Fifteen boys and nine girls received free golf clubs, free golf bags, and a summer golf inter uh, membership at Green Hill. A few of the caddies earned Francis We Met scholarships for college. For the second year in a row this summer, Matt will conduct a free golf instruction program for veterans. Matt also served on the city council in Fitchburg and his wife, Lisa, who's right here with him, served on the school committee in Fitchburg. They've since moved to Lunenburg. Lisa is an assistant dean at Fitchburg State. Matt and Lisa have two daughters, Madeline and Elizabeth. Golf pros work weekends and put in long hours during the season. Dealing with the public isn't always easy, but Matt continues to do his job well and a, in a polite, friendly manner. Matt richly deserves this award, whether he believes it or not. So Matt, come on up and get your award. I want to start by thanking my wife. It's 
it's not easy being married to a golf pro. Every holiday, she has given up. Every weekend, she has given up. Every summer vacation, she has given up. And without her tremendous support and love, um, all the joys of my life would not be here. Uh, I'd also like to say congratulations to, uh, this is easier to say, um, all the other nominees. It occurred to me uh, that we all do the same job. We just do it at different locations. Um, and I am fortunate that my location has the best views in the city. Um, so it's not all bad being a, uh, a golf pro. Uh, I am fortunate in that I have seen generations of kids uh, grow up and play golf at that golf course. Um, many have been through my kids' programs, and I just want to recount a story of a small group of them that went on to play in their high school teams. They went off to college. Uh, they come back to Green Hill now that they're adults in their own families, and every year, just about every year, they come back and they run their annual Coors Light Classic, um, is what they call it. There's about 25 of them that come in each year. The winner of the annual Coors Light Classic receives a oversized, dirty, thrift shop uh, sport coat embossed with the names of all the past winners uh, in it. And the loser of the event, and it took several years for me to figure out um, what they gave to the loser of the event, the loser of the event each year, um, the player with the highest score is given the Matthew Moisen Player of the Year Award. Uh, so obviously, awards like this are, are not strange to me uh, in any, uh, any way. Uh, in my position, um, I can help a lot of young people out, and uh, one of the very first things I did, and I, Mr. Doyle kind of highlighted this, one of the first things I did when I came to the city of Worcester uh, was start a free program for kids. In my very, very first class of kids, uh, there was a young man named Jimmy uh, Caladropoulos. He is now a real estate agent here in Worcester, and he was a fun kid, and I just looked at him, and I called him Sunshine. Um, to this day, whenever I see Jimmy, it's sunshine. Uh, in that class was a young man named Patterson. Uh, and then there were three boys that were adopted into the Rossetti family, Johnny, David, and Danny. Um, the boys came from horrible backgrounds, um, India, um, El Salvador, very, very um, challenging backgrounds. And the Rossetti family, opened their arms up and brought these kids in, uh, and these three boys and these, and these brothers were in my very, very first um, program. Um, in year two, they were all there again. In year three, they were all there again. Um, one October morning, I got a call that uh, Patterson lost control of his vehicle and was paralyzed, and Danny was killed. Uh, it was... I called his mom that, uh, that morning, and it was then I knew that the free program would then become the Danny Rossetti program. Uh, it's, it's a very fun program. If you have never seen the Danny Rossetti Junior Golf Program, you are missing a show. We have water balloon fights, fun and games, uh, activities, contests, there are, the slip and slide is the highlight of the, uh, the event every summer. Um, and that is done with the help and love of volunteers. Mr. Doyle has volunteered many times in that program and has seen it up close uh, and in person. So thank you, Bill, for that. I don't get the opportunity to say that um, often enough. Uh, I get all these little notes. That's one of the joys of my job. One of the 
not so great joys of my job is of the 34,000 people that play there every day, they all call. And I'm just going to give you a sampling. These are real phone calls that um, come into the golf course. Um, bring, bring, hello, Green Hill. Yeah, you're going to uh, tee times around 8 o'clock. I've got 7.52. How's that? Well, what do you got later? I've got 10.30 is the next one. Oh, give me that one. That's much better. I don't understand that. Um, bring, bring. Hello? Yeah. Sunshine. You need a tea time? You bet. I'll give you a tea time. Off you go. Bring, bring. What time does your 4 o'clock rate start? <laughs> what? It starts at uh, 4 o'clock. And, and every once in a while, I get that, that phone call that comes in, and it's, um, do you do any programs for kids? Uh, and those are the ones that you, that you like to answer. Um, just going to leave you with a quick quote, because all bad speeches end in quick quotes. Green Hill Golf Course uh, is 1,000 feet of elevation. Our second hole uh, is equal to the airport and is the highest point in the city of Worcester. And on the second tee, we have a memorial bench that the Rossetti family put in for Danny. And the quote that sits on that bench is, this is the closest spot to heaven in the city of Worcester. And that's the way I feel about it. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Every year there's a moment, and I think Matt just gave it to us. Thank you. So iPads, Chromebooks, hotspots, Google Classroom, more than buzzwords, these became our literal lifeline as the pandemic raged. Our next honoree was the critical player in issuing some 15,000 Chromebooks to Worcester Public School students in a matter of mere weeks, and then supporting them and the entire school network throughout the pandemic. It's my pleasure to welcome Joyce Augustus, committee Thomas Green committee member, research bureau board member, and a small business owner to introduce our next honoree, Zach Razak, ne network administrator for the IT department at the Worcester Public Schools. Good afternoon, everyone. And it's an honor for me to be here and to present this award to Zach Razak, thank you for your service. Um, I was so impressed with Zach's um, information that he provided. It's amazing. Zach, just some um, background. Zach worked, works as a network administrator for information technology department in the Worcester Public Schools, and he's been doing that for the last five years. And so he's responsible for the entire school system. He helps coordinate the, um, the IT specialists and all the other departments. Uh, he also does, um, he's responsible for all the digital um, equipment, troubleshooting, MCAS testing, you name it, he is responsible for. And he takes great pride in what he does. He's always ready and willing to help. He goes above and beyond. He's always ready to take on new challenges, including more, learning more about the intersection of all the other responsibilities of the different um, you know, departments in which he, he um, intersects with. And he's considered an expert in all these applications. So what, what really is so impressive about um, Zach is that at the start of the pandemic, he headed up the entire effort, as mentioned earlier, to distribute to, you know, Chromebooks to over 15,000 students. But what they didn't tell you and what his wife told me just recently, <laughs> just a minute ago, on every single Chromebook, had his telephone number. His cell phone number was on every single Chromebook. 
<laughs> and he got call from, calls from about 26,000 students across um, the nation, and not just out of Massachusetts, because his job and what he did was service the entire public schools. And what people didn't realize was during the pandemic, a lot of the um, essential workers, their, they had to send their kids to their parents or friends and family to um, help with you know, their um, extended studies. And so he interacted with so many families across the nation, grandparents, trying to get their kids, um, their grandkids hooked up to the system, troubleshooting every possible um, issue you could possibly think of. And what was impressive for me was the fact that he encountered a, a small dilemma. And for him, it was small. For me, it would have been a big dilemma. There was a person that was, um, had hearing impaired and he, there was, no way to communicate effectively with this person and being resourceful as, as Zach is, um, they decided to FaceTime with a translator to be able to discover what the issues were, resolve the problems, and collect all the information and data he needed to do his job to make sure that this individual, um, pro this problem was resolved. And I thought that was so impressive because he's really thinking on his feet, you know, he's like the nucleus of everything that's going, going on in his environment, and he does it with such calm and patience, and um, it's so admirable to know, you know, these individuals. Also, one tidbit that his wife also shared is that everyone in the school system would call Zach, and he would not only, when he gets the emails, he would not even pick up the emails. He'll just jump in his car and go there. And before you know it, there's a knock on the door and there's Zach standing, resolved to, ready to resolve their, their issue. So that's the type of person he is. He's, he's ready and willing to help in every possible way that he can, and it's so admirable. And, and the patience, you know, I heard a lot about patience. He has a lot of that, um, and, and that is, is very impressive about Zach. Um, some words that I'd like to use that, that I would like to um, share that was used to describe Zach. Humble, skilled, dedicated, efficient, self-motivated, passionate, selfless, enthusiastic, and may I add, driven and patience. Because Zach cares so deeply about the people he works with. He cares about people in general. And I think for him it's very gratifying when he leaves at the end of the day to feel that he's really done great work by helping others. And that says a lot about his character. Um, also, some tidbits I'd like to leave um, with each and every one of you about Zach, things that you might not know. Um, Zach started out in building tech at South High. He is married to his beautiful wife, Reina, um, who is also in the school system. She is the head of the math department at Doherty High, and they've been married for 32 years. Um, he, his, two his, his two children are here with him. Um, we have AJ and Aya. Did I say that right? Awesome. Um, and so it's interesting because the little break that he gets, because he's always on call 24 seven, and the little breaks that he gets, he goes riding, he rides his bike, he tinkers with his car. There's one car that he owned and he didn't really want to get rid of. <laughs> the, the shift broke. And he was so resourceful, he found this large screwdriver and stuck it in the shifter and <laughs> used that to shift his car. And so that's the resourceful person that Zach is. And I'm just so honored 
to be able to present this award to him. Um, I've been told that he fixes everything. And since he was a, a, a kid, everything that's broken, broken, he will fix it. And, and that's who he, he really is. And I'd like to leave you with a, a quote from his supervisor, um, Bob Walton. And it says, enthusiasm should be Jack's middle name. Zach is one of those people who you can ask to do something and you know he'll say yes. He is ready and willing every day and he's always excited to do even more. Zach goes above and beyond when it comes to filling his role as a network administrator of the Worcester Public School. And so it's my honor to present this award to you, Zach. Congratulations. I am not a great public speaker, so please bear with me. <laughs> but with IT, it really, in the Worcester Public Schools, it really is about the teamwork that happened. So many different things had to come into play. Uh, so many different departments had to work together. I happened to be in a spot where I saw all these departments interact. and. It was an amazing sight to see. Um, I really would like to thank like Bob Walton and Sarah Curiosas for nominating me. I'd also like to thank the superintendent, Benenda, and Brian Allen, as well as the selection committee. I, re I really am honored by this. Uh, the transition to remote learning was a, su was a success because many departments came together and I believe they should be honored as well. Uh, I would like to thank Tim Williams and Bob Walton again for their leadership and mentoring during the process. There were so many changes happening and it was nice when we were saying like, we need to make this change. They were there saying, yes, that's great, let's go. And at the same time, we have a group of people, uh, the IT support specialists, now these guys work with the buildings directly and they not only help distribute all the Chromebooks, but they were also fixing them on the fly. And this is a group of, at the time it was eight people who are really just everywhere as well. And I was helping to coordinate that. Uh, we even had uh, the transportation department was helping. We had all the Chromebooks were in locked carts, had to be dismantled had to make sure everything was working to get them to the kids. Uh, the transportation department chipped in. It was really, really amazing. And another big part of this was the SAGE group. Uh, they controlled the student information systems and making sure like uh, all the students were enrolled, all the accounts were created so the students can log into their devices. And with them, Alex Veal and Paul Johnson, who managed their back end, were a huge help. Out of all the groups, there are a couple of people who really were fantastic. Uh, it's two of the guys I work with, Joe Basha and Mike Smith. Uh, they're also the network engineers. Uh, they were a big help with the Chromebooks, but also keeping my sanity. Uh, they were really great. <laughs> But during COVID, like, it was amazing because we had students were spread out all over. We had kids in Florida, California, Arizona, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and Brazil. So trying to work with them during all the different time zones was really an interesting sight. And we were using services like the language line uh, to work, to translate, to get everybody up and going. It, it was really, really amazing and working with such a talented team made it easier for me. Uh, sometimes uh, we would actually, I'd have to go to people's houses. Uh, if you had grandparents were like, uh, would call and say, I have this iPad, 
don't know what to do with it. <laughs> uh, so we'd go and uh, that time get the students sent out. And one thing that it really brought, especially with the use of hotspots, and our network was 50 plus buildings, and this is what we could, con con uh, could control. But suddenly, with the hotspots, the entire city of Worcester became a school. So our network expanded to everywhere. And it really brought the point where schools are where the students are. And being able to support them and with the team that we have was really, really an amazing thing. And the teachers, teachers uh, were trying to troubleshoot, help out, and did some triaging. And they would know, OK, this is a quick fix. This is how you do it. And we worked with them closely. And they were a huge help, which did free us up a little bit so we can get, so we could focus on the delivering of the devices. And I cannot say enough, really, about the people I work with, but especially my family. During this and running around in the crazy hours, they were there for me. So I wanted to really thank them. That's all I got. <laughs> As we noted earlier, humble, humble, humble. When the COVID pandemic hit, we were all forced to enter a new unknown arena, fraught with public health risks and ever-changing guidance and protocols. Our next honoree, Connor Robichaud, Regional Projects Coordinator and Principal Planner at the Central Mass Regional Planning Commission, stepped up to help CMRPC's 40 member communities coordinate funding, test kit distribution, regional testing sites, and so much more. Please welcome everyone's favorite local radio personality, Hank Stoltz, from the Talk of the Commonwealth, to introduce Connor. Well, it is my great pleasure to introduce a fellow Oakmont Regional High School alum, an individual who has dedicated himself to making central Massachusetts a better place to live. Indeed, hear what Thomas S. Green Award recipient Connor Robichaud's peers say about him. Utmost professional, calm and patient in the midst of crisis, even keeled, inspires trust and confidence. Good qualities to have when you are in the midst of a pandemic. Now, Connor has now become the Regional Projects Manager for the Central Massachusetts Regional Planning Commission. And in his job, he works with Worcester and 39 other communities. And he works to identify new opportunities for those communities to work together. Now, Connor's a great believer in regionalization. And during the battle against COVID-19, it was essential that these diverse communities be able to pool resources. You think about Worcester, you think about Worcester's ability to respond to a pandemic. This is the second largest city in New England. It has its own health department. It has resources. Now you think about a community that is more than 20 square miles and has a population of 1,000. It's a big difference. And that describes a lot of those 39 communities. And this is where Connor's resourcefulness and his adaptability came into play. Because there was no playbook for anything like this. The CMRPC, that's the uh, Central Massachusetts Regional Planning Commission. I'm just going to shorten that real quick here. It had to shift gears to be able to help. And they needed someone to step up. And that person was Connor Robichaud. So he figured out how to create a public health department within the CMRPC. He figured out how to get things done, and he became that guy, the person that people trusted, the one that you can turn to. Now, here's how one of those first Zoom meetings goes, and we all remember back when we were first learning Zoom and we were back in the, in the pandemic at the beginning. Well, this is you've got all these people together and you're up on the uh, big screen and nobody's really sure of anything. So they 
you would introduce all these people from all these different agencies because you're all going to come together to help. So it would be, you know, here's Dr. So-and-so and Dr. Hoosie wants it and Professor this and that and Connor. Because <laughs> they were there to help, but they were inventing this literally as they were going along. This wasn't his background, but when it came to getting 90,000 COVID test kits to towns in the central Massachusetts area, well, you turned not to Dr. Hoosie, was it? You turned to Connor, because he was the guy who was going to get things done. Now, these smaller towns, they didn't have the wherewithal independently to purchase these kits, for example. They would have gotten lost in the shuffle. So you had to band them together so that you could come up with a half million dollar order. And that's what Connor figured out how to do, and he made that happen. And I'm going to tell you a, a quick story here that I think sort of exemplifies what he had to come up with and what he had to do, but also why he is a Thomas S. Green Award winner. The above and beyond the call of duty that everybody here has, has exhibited tonight. The extra steps that all of our award winners have, the extra step they take that sets them apart. So you've got these tens of thousands of COVID kits and they're coming from New York State in this big tractor trailer. And then you're going to meet the guy and you're going to take possession of them and then you're going to unload them and then you're going to get all your volunteers and your vans and you're going to distribute all of these to the towns, right? So no small task. But then your eyes kind of pop open at, at, at 2 a.m. and you go, oh, well, what if that guy shows up with his tractor trailer early? What if he shows up like a day early and there's nobody there to meet him? Will he turn around? Will he take all my kits away? Will the towns not, not get them? Now that's probably a little bit crazy, quite frankly, and not really going to happen, but okay, you know, what if? So Connor thinks of this and he goes, well, they have Wi-Fi in the parking lot of where I'm going to meet this guy, so I'll just go sit there like 6 a.m. on the day before they're supposed to arrive and I'll just do my work from there just in case. Now it actually turns out that in this case the truck is a day early. So premonition, paranoia, call it <laughs> what you will, but I think that it does go to show the dedication to making sure that the job gets done, that every angle is covered, uh, that the number of hours, as many people have said, just doesn't matter. It's the end result. That's what's important. Those towns got their COVID test kits when they were the most needed. Connor's backstory worth touching on, on quickly here is, as well in our limited time. In high school, he volunteered in his hometown of, of Westminster, and he knew that he wanted to work back or give back through working with municipalities. Because isn't that what every 16-year-old says? <laughs> Man, someday I just want to go work with municipalities. But Connor, yeah, that was it. He had, that, that's what he wanted to, uh, to do. So he started out five years ago, part-time, at CMPR RPC. And he kept uh, gaining more and more responsibility. And now he is helping as they become an affiliate for departments of public health in the towns that they serve. So Connor believes in the mission of building municipal, municipal capacity, in regionalization, and his leadership along with the ever-growing workforce at the Central Massachusetts Regional Planning Commission will help shape the region that we live in over the next decade. So whether it's in public health or public housing, which has been much in the, in the news, of course, they're going to be on the front lines making that difference through dedicated individuals like Connor Robichaud. Last thing, because I come from radio and I know how to do a plug. So uh, we can help out. Now, what they have is they are involved in putting together a comprehensive regional plan, Imagine 2050. It's a vision for central Massachusetts, and they have a survey out. I only have one. I'm sure you brought hundreds. 
It's all, it, 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 it's all right. It, it, it's all right. Uh, they do have a survey out. Luckily, we're ready to have you all go on your phones. You can take it here. You just head to the website, and that is cmrpc.org, and take a moment, fill out the survey. Uh, economy, environment, equity, and you get to help shape the future. Just like, ladies and gentlemen, 2022 Thomas S. Green Award winner, Connor Robichaud. That was very generous. Thank you, Hank. I got major points for the survey shout out with my boss. That's great. Uh, you can imagine for someone who can't take a compliment, this is sort of maximum discomfort. But um, a friend of mine reminded me I also don't love criticism, so <laughs> really can't win. Um, I do. Uh, I'm really honored that my coworkers would, would nominate me for this. Uh, they mean so much to me, and as do my, my parents who are here tonight, and my girlfriend Kaylee, who kept me uh, you know, from being too cranky every day, bringing me snacks and hugs, so I wasn't lashing out at people on the, on the Zoom calls. Uh, yeah, I, um, you, know, you hear a lot in the past couple of years, we've all been through it, uh, folks saying they're feel more isolated, feel more divided. Um, and, you know, I'm not an optimist by nature, but I work with some of the most dedicated and competent and good-hearted people at that table back there. Uh, and they do uh, really, really great work every day. They're a constant reminder that if you're dedicated to your community and um, working with a group like that, those feelings are, are nowhere to be found. So uh, I'd like to thank them for everything they do. and. Uh, thank the Research Bureau for, for uh, honoring that, that sort of public service. So thank you and have a great night. Our final honoree this evening is Kara Stone, Executive Assistant at the Worcester Public Library. Grandma Kara, as she's known affectionately to the kiddos at the neighboring YWCA Child Care Center, has worked tirelessly to support library patrons within the building's walls, but perhaps even more importantly, the broader community. Please welcome Paul Matthews to introduce Kara. Thanks very much, Ellen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I have the very fortunate task of introducing Kara, and I say fortunate because it's quite simple. All I have to do is use the words of her coworkers and colleagues and clients, all of whom have been very eloquent. But it's really an honor to recognize her, given her role at the, at the library. It's also a genuine personal pleasure. I honestly have had a Worcester Public Library card my entire life. I got it at Tatnick when it was in the basement of Tatnick Elementary. I think I was about three. So it's been fascinating, and I mentioned to Kara and Jason before this started, seeing the remarkable physical transformation of the library, not just in recent years, but I remember the old design and all the changes at the library. And, uh, it's been astounding to me to see the transformation of the library, not only from a facility standpoint, but with its staffing, its mission, and its operations. And Kara really exemplifies the vision of the library. And I'm, I'm going to, uh, Jason, thank you for having a great website. I can read you the vision statement for the Worcester Public Library, which is that it will be a welcoming destination in the leading provider of resources to inform, enlighten, and enrich our diverse community. And it's quite clear to me, reading these nominations on Kara's behalf, just how much she lives and breathes that vision and does so much to put it into an operational reality for the patrons of the library. Uh, and it's clear just talking to her the few times I've been fortunate to talk to her about the library, how passionate and insightful she is about the importance of that role. And 
Again, the library website's very comprehensive. It has their mission statement, their core values and principles, and one of which is adapt to change and plan for innovation. And again, it's very clear in the testimonials on Kara's behalf just how much she has been part of adapting, changing, and innovating library programs to meet the very diverse needs of the patrons and public who use the library for so many purposes. I, I think we all recognize that the pandemic has led to profound change for all of us. But when I think about the change the library and the library staff have undergone over the course of the pandemic, it is truly, truly striking. We've heard today about our school system, our educators, and so many others who have changed. But the library itself, uh, talk about accelerated change. They've all taken on entire new roles serving the community. Uh, not only by the stereotypical lending of books, I think about my own interactions, now it's electronic loans, it's helping patrons with social service issues. We did a report a few years back and worked with one of our colleagues on adult learners of uh, English as a, as a second language. And the sheer level of services the library staff are providing in that area is staggering. So again, to crib, and uh, I'm going to read the words of others who know Kara far better than I, but uh, they include, Kara has demonstrated a commitment to this city that is unmatched. Kara is always willing to roll up her sleeves and help out in any way she can. Kara is the type of employee that employers dream of having on their staff. She is responsible, caring, flexible, considerate, and a team player. The list is too long. Kara is deeply caring, is always ready to take on new tasks, and is the best advocate for the staff we could ask for. Kara is someone who always can get the job done, whether she, she's organizing a block party for thousands of the patrons or making personalized holiday gifts for every member of the library staff. Kara is endlessly thoughtful and attentive to the needs of the staff, the board, and most importantly, the patrons. Kara sacrifices her personal time working around the clock to ensure that the library is a safe and joyful place to work. I cannot say enough about how her hard work, creativity, and heart make a difference for the Worcester and Central Mass community. Kara has made an indomitable impact on the library during her time. Her warmth, positive attitude, generous spirit, and sense of humor have made her a friend to all staff, volunteers, and patrons who meet her. She does not shy away from tasks that are too grand or too small, always offers her time, and has simply never uttered the phrase, that's not my job. I am continually humbled and in awe of all she does, and I know there are many who share my feelings, from the city manager's office to the average unhoused person in downtown. And let me tell you, that's quite a range. <laughs> um, throughout the COVID pandemic, Kara took on additional responsibilities that included adding hours before she arrived at the library to visit local homeless shelters in coordinating vaccine clinics with the Health and Human Services Department while she continues to do this day. While others sheltered at home, she was in the community, putting herself at risk to help others. These efforts have helped numerous people around our community access the services they needed to survive. Throughout it all, Kara has never once complained or put herself first. And the quote that I think best closes this is, if you haven't had the pleasure of working with Kara Stone, I invite you to the Worcester Public Library to come witness all of her amazing and transformative work. So Kara, on behalf of so many patrons, thank you. I'm not good at this, but I'm gonna give it a try. But first of all, thank you very much um, for that wonderful speech. I didn't realize that everybody said all those wonderful things about me. And I wanna say thank you to the Worcester Regional Research Bureau for selecting me and congratulate all the other winners. Um, I will say, I'm gonna get emotional, sorry. <laughs> the pandemic was um, actually a very different time um, 
it was great to be able to, to do different things and be out in the community and help, but during that time, I also lo lost um, my mom first and then my dad. Um, so along with all of that, working with my coworkers and just doing different things, it, it, sorry, <laughs> you know, it was a lot, but I know how much people needed me. And when I was at the library, I got the phone call from the previous city manager, Mr. Augustus, and he said, I need you, and I would like you to start going to the homeless shelters every morning um, and work with them and work with the patrons and, and see what their needs are and, and help Health and Human Services, which I didn't mind doing at all. And I will tell you, even though I knew the majority of the people that were at the homeless shelters because of coming into the library, I learned a lot about them. I learned that the majority of them um, are wonderful people wonderful people and that they just have, you know, unfortunately some mental health issues, just down on their luck. But, you know, getting to know them as much as I did when they, the pandemic, you know, lightened up a little bit and we were able to allow people back in the library, I actually get to see them. And they still come in and they talk to me and they thank me and, you know, and say that, you know, I was a big part of helping them, which made me feel really great. But I could not do anything that I do without all of that group right over there. <laughs> because they are like they make my job easier but they know that i do what i do for them and without them we wouldn't have the west of public library so thank you guys and thank you to everybody else <laughs> Wow, just wow. I'm amazed every year, honored to be part of this group and, and really thrilled to be with you. Um, that concludes the formal presentation part of our program. I just again wanna say to Joe, Matt, Zach, Connor, and Kara, thank you so, so very much for everything that you do, that you've done and that you continue to do. I um, wanna again thank our sponsors and my fellow committee members for, for picking such a, a fine group of, of honorees this evening and I invite you to, to stay and mingle and congratulate them in person and, and enjoy some food and beverage. So thank you all very much. Don't forget to nominate for next year. Take care.